Got no warning when her husband left here, got up one morning, and that was it. He was gone before, I don't know, 12, 1 o'clock that day, somewhere in there. Went on to be with the Lord. This is the thing about this world. You don't know when you're leaving it. You need to be ready. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles tonight, if you turn with me to the book of Exodus, second book of the Pentateuch, written by Moses 3,500 years ago. Shows you how little things have changed with man. We use a big word as it relates to God. It's called immutability. It simply means the unchanging nature of God. He changes not. Since he is an eternal being, it stands to reason he would not change. Exodus chapter number 34 and verse number 1. Exodus 34, 1. And the Lord said to Moses, Hew thee two tables of stone like unto the first. And I will write upon these tables the words that were in the first tables which thou breakest. And be ready in the morning, and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai. And present thyself there to me in the top of the mount. And no man shall come up with thee, neither let any man be seen throughout all the mount. Neither let the flocks nor herds feed before that mount. And he hewed two tables of stone like unto the first, and Moses rose up early in the morning and went up unto, the mount, up, up unto Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him and took in his hand the two tables of stone. Father, bless your word. Bless your word now. In Jesus' name, amen. I call your attention to a number of things before we move any further in the message tonight. If you notice the third word in verse, number 30, in verse 1 of chapter 34, is a capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. This is what we call printer's type. The King James translators, when they put this in the text, they wanted you to know that the tetragrammaton, yod heh vow heh, the four Hebrew consonants, are here. The only way we know how to pronounce these is because the Masoretes gave us vowel points, and we pronounce it, I do, Jehovah or Jehovah. I don't go with Yahweh. I have no reason to depart from Jehovah. And so what we have here is God's name. And the Lord said unto Moses, two tables of stone. So we're not writing in stone now and not in the fleshly heart. When you read the book of Jeremiah, he no longer writes his law in stone. He writes it into the heart. But the man must be capable of receiving what God has to say to him. If you notice now, Moses is going to be following the Lord. He's going to be his master, his teacher, his Lord, his God. And it's important for Moses to understand who he's serving. And it's the same with us tonight. Who do we serve? Uh, do we serve a system? Do we serve a catechism? Do we serve some sort of a, uh, some sort of a man-made uh, hierarchy uh, where we elevate men far above where they should be? Or do we serve the Lord God, the Lord Christ? Who is it that we serve? In order to serve him, we need to know him. There's something we should know about him, something that relates to his nature. Just exactly who is he? Remember, the immutability of God. I change not, he said. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. God does not change from generation to generation. Scripture says that he is no respecter of persons. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. And so we read in the book of Exodus chapter number 34 and verse number 5 as God presents himself to Moses. He wants him to understand a few things about himself. If you'll notice in chapter 34 and verse number 5, the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. It's important because his name is who he is. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children, unto the third and to the fourth generation. And Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. And he said, if now I have found grace in thy sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray thee, go among us, for it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for thine inheritance. Moses got the message loud and clear. When God began to present his holiness and his glory, his majesty in the face of this mortal being, the only thing that Moses could cry out for, O oh God, have grace, grace, grace in thy sight. 
And so Moses was wise in that, and he understood something about God that no one else at his age did. For the Lord said to all the children of Israel, I will show my acts. They can see what I'm doing. They can understand if they please, if they'll seek the face of God, they can see what I'm doing. But Moses, I'm going to show you my way. I'm going to let you read my heart. I'm going to show you what's dear to me, what's near to me, who I am and what I'm made of. Can you drink from the heart of God? Can you understand the heart of God? Or do you rely tonight upon your fallen nature? Is it your, is it your adult brain that you're searching and following after God with? Is it that heart, as I preached about this morning, which is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked? Who can know it? The Lord said, I try the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. I don't know my heart and you don't know your heart. And my mind can be this one minute and that the next minute. So what do I base everything I am upon? Me? No. I base it upon that unchangeable one. Amen. That unchangeable one. In other words, when you learn something about God, it stays the same from thenceforth. You learn something about his character, mark it down. Base your life upon it. You learn something about his being, write it down in your soul because that's the way he's going to be throughout the rest of your life. So Moses, you're going to serve me. You're going to learn me. You're going to understand something about me. Jeremiah cried out in chapter number nine, thus saith Jehovah, the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me. Amen. That you understand and know him. He's not something that someone told you about. He's someone that you know personally in your soul. That I am the Lord, which exercise loving kindness judgment and righteousness in the earth for in these things I delight saith the Lord to Abraham shall not the judge of the whole earth do right I am but dust and ashes old Jehovah the Lord God Almighty shall not the judge of the whole earth do right you better believe he will that's one of those characteristics of God that I base my ministry upon my relationship with the Lord upon amen theology comes and theology goes catechisms are written and catechisms are passed away but I want to tell you something something. God is here forever. And my friend, we can make mistakes when we write stuff like that. We can fail. Our churches can fail. Our, our synods can fail. And the, all of the stuff that is man-made can come far short of understanding the totality, the majesty, the grace, the wondrous of almighty God himself. We need to know him tonight, folks. And you've got a book in your hand. Once again, I bring you to this Bible. This is God's inspired infallible word. Do you really believe that? Do you really believe that? Well, then get angry with that one that tries to tear it down before your very soul. Because when he tears this down, he's building himself up. He wants to tear your word, the word of God down to take away from you that foundation of your faith. The word of God is quick and powerful and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart neither is there anything that is hid there's nothing nothing is said or done that is hid from the eyes of him with whom we have to do Moses you're on top of the mountain you're alone you're with me there's none around and I am placing upon you a burden I'm giving you understanding and wisdom that none below you have you're one of a kind and there will only be one of you Moses not another will ever set foot where you have and he accepted that even though he wasn't perfect like any of the rest of us none of us are perfect there if you're looking for somebody perfect go jump in a hole somewhere you live in fantasy world amen we all have our problems but old Moses listened and he listened well and when he did he cried at oh God I want the grace let me find grace in thy sight so tonight we're going to talk about grace the grace of God the grace of God. The Bible said in John chapter number one and verse number 14, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. Now John could say that because John was on top of the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter, James, and John, the three of the inner circle. John was there. He saw the glory. He saw him shining brighter than the sun. My friend, that's glory. Make no mistake. And the apostle John said, we beheld his glory full of grace 
grace and truth. The law came by Moses, the Bible says, but grace and truth came by our Lord Jesus Christ. Why was the law so, why was it so futile? Why was it so fragile? Why, why, was it, why did it come up so short? Because all it could do was tell you what to do. But Almighty God gave you the power to do what he said to do, and it comes through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. So what are the elements of grace? Well, one is mercy. Where there is mercy, my friend, you're beginning to understand grace. Grace reaches out to that one that does not deserve it. There's not a one of us in this house tonight that deserved to be forgiven. God bless your soul. Listen to me. If we received what we deserved, we'd be in hell right now. Amen. Come off your high horse. We need grace. We need grace. We need mercy. We need him reaching out to us. And by the grace of God, we're saved. Mercy, mercy, mercy. You you want justice you don't want justice do you want holiness you don't want holiness do you want that nature of God you want grace and grace brings mercy then long suffering is a great element of the grace of God some of you have run from God for 10 15 20 30 40 50 years you've run all your life from Almighty God amen you have you've run and you've ran but you know something he still will take you in the long suffering of God Amen, amen, amen. I don't know that the thief on the cross had ever been spoken to before by the Lord God. Nothing is said one way or the other, but there's one thing for certain. Here he was on his deathbed. Here he was with a wasted life. Here he was. He deserved everything that was happening to him. Yet the grace of God reached over and saved his soul. Amen. 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 Now let me tell you something tonight. This might make you mad. It depends on your relationship with the Lord. Do you remember when God called Jonah? Jonah, he said, I want you to go to Nineveh. He said, that huge, large city, you go over there and you preach to them 40 days. And God's going to overthrow this place. That's right. Jonah got the message. Well, Jonah didn't want to go. Because Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. And Syria was the enemy of Israel. What am I? What are you saying, Lord? You want me to go to my enemy? And get them right with God? Yes, sir, my friend. Because there's the unchangeable nature of God. So puff up if you want to. He'll, he'll cleanse and save your enemies. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Digest that for a moment. <laughs> that one you won't speak to, he'll save. <laughs> That one you wouldn't, you wouldn't, you wouldn't get married if it stopped up in a jug, he'll save. That one you think has done you wrong and done you dirty and stabbed you in the back, he'll save. He'll save the sorriest, low down piece of garbage that ever walked the earth. And he was the greatest enemy you ever had. And it'll make you so mad you can't stand it. But if he gets right with God, he'll forgive him. <laughs> and let me lay it on you tonight. <laughs> you have to too. <laughs> Amen. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Forgive us this day. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive those our debtors to us or against us. Amen. Forgive us. I forgive you, you forgive me. It's a wonderful thing to be able to forgive because that's an element of grace. We refuse to forgive. We like to carry our hurts and our pains and puff up and walk around puffed up and just carry on and tell everybody while so-and-so stabbed us in the back and cut our throat and how mean so-and-so was to us and all how it pumps up our ego and you miserable soul, you can't get a good night's rest to save your soul. Last night, praise God, I went to bed at 10, got up at 6, at, at six o'clock in the morning. Some eight hours of sleep I got last night and slept like a baby. Hallelujah to God. Amen. When's the last time you got, got you slept like that? When's the last time you got a good night's sleep? The Bible said God gives rest to his people. Amen. So it says forgiveness when we refuse to forgive. He's a beneficiary when we close the doors. He opens them. He'll feed that one, my dear friend, that doesn't deserve to be fed. He'll give water to that one that doesn't deserve it. You see, grace is all based upon the fact that God is gracious, merciful, and favor. His favor is extended to us because he's bigger than us. He's greater than us. He thinks on a higher level than we do. We wander around, stumble around in relationship with each other, our social interaction. That's not God. He's far above us. He doesn't think like we think. He doesn't see like we see. The almighty God is a gracious God. Amen. Beneficiary. What about that? The Bible said it rains on the just and the unjust. 
Yes, it does. That godless hellion out there, this miserable creep, the murdering devils that are walking the streets tonight, the predators that are seeking, he still gives them air and food and rain and, 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 and what the needs of life. Why? Look, he could kill them. He could smack them. He could slap them into eternity. He could wipe them from the face of the earth. He could take them away. But he's gracious, gracious, gracious. And therefore his benefit, he doesn't say, well, I'm going to feed my people and you're going to starve. If he gives a crop, both sides can eat. He's acceptable. He's acceptance. He, he accepts. He accepts. I said this one time, and I had some people raise their eyebrows at me. I said, God will take anything. Amen. That includes you. He'll take anything. He took me. He took me. I would use, let me tell you something tonight. Let's just shell the corn. Ain't no way you're ever going to see all the stuff I did before I got saved. It's not going to happen. The Bible said he cast it as far as the east is from the west. He forgot it. It is no more. It doesn't, it doesn't exist anymore. He forgave me and he took it away. Now, how many of you, God bless your little self-righteous soul tonight, would you want God Almighty to put on this screen up here behind us everything you ever did? There's not a one of you in here that'd want that. If, you're, if you got any sense, you wouldn't want that. You see, he accepts us, not for who we are, we're accepted by the grace of God because of who Christ is. For all your sin was laid upon him and he received you. He loves to be with his presence. Did you know there's nothing in the Bible that talks about how God desires to be with angels? You ever read that? You ever read in the Bible where the Bible never doesn't say a word from Genesis to Revelation about righteous angels? It doesn't mention them. Holy angels, yes. But you see, holiness and righteousness are two different things. Holiness has to do with separation, position. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God. Apart, apart, apart. But righteous has to do with morality. And all of our righteousness, he says in the Old Testament, he thunders his out and he said, every bit of your righteousness is as a filthy rag in the sight of God. So the Bible says in 1 Corinthians, he has made unto us righteousness. Our Lord Jesus Christ is my righteousness tonight. You can come and tear me down all you want to. Talk about me like a dog and all I can say is, Amen, son, you pretty well got it right. But here's the thing. That's not how I approach God. I approach God through my Lord Jesus Christ. He's my righteousness. And you can't tear him down. Amen. A sinless, perfect one. Remember how many times I told you? A thousand times. When the Lord Jesus Christ ascended to the right hand of the Father, he ascended to the right hand of the Father with a righteousness that did not exist until he lived a sinless, perfect life on this earth. And that was the righteousness of the God man. Amen. And then finally, 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 in these elements of grace is reconciliation. It's to bring two enemies together. And my friend, this is important. Romans chapter number five, verse nine, the Bible said, much more than being now justified by his blood, we should be saved from wrath through him. For if, now listen to this, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Now there's a lot in that, in that statement. Saved by his life has nothing to do with saving your soul. It has to do with saving your testimony, your walk with God, the life you live on this earth. His life at the right hand of the Father, me, during, me as, the, as our high priest is saving your life. But your soul is saved by the death of Christ on the cross. You're born of the Spirit of God because His Spirit was offered up into the presence of the Almighty. My friend, there's a big difference between the two. But don't you look at this scripture here. 2 Corinthians 5. I would that you read it with me tonight because if you have a young man that goes off to a Bible college somewhere, those who run that college should go to 2 Corinthians 5 verses 18 through 21. And teach on it and hammer on it and preach on it until it finally takes hold. Because this is one of the most important scriptures in all the Bible, folks. This is very, very, very important what I'm about to read to you. It says in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 18, In all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, 
as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ did be ye reconciled to God. For hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You see that righteousness shows up again? Now I don't have the time to get into whole, all of that beautiful scripture, but I want to call your attention to something. Note carefully. Notice how God has emphasized a certain part of man's relationship with God. That's why I do this, because reconciliation has to do not with God's side, it has to do with your side. Now listen carefully. It's not so much the sin issue, though sin is an issue. God, the apostle deals with it in 1 John. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. If we say we have not sin, we call God a liar. Amen? It's that simple. But it's not so much the sin issue that he wants to bring to your mind. What he's saying to you is, it's not so much sin it is your attitude toward God. You see, the Bible from Genesis to Revelation has theology, it has history, it has poetry, it has all these beautiful things. But the reason the Bible was written was to bring man and God together. And there's only one that can bring man and God together, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the only one. There's no other way. But look carefully the way he did it. Look at this. It has to do not with God's attitude toward you. He's already settled that. He reconciled you to himself. You see the wall separating man and God, God removed. The animosity between God and man, God removed, not man, God did. You see the sin issue that sends a soul to hell, he took care of for the Bible says through John the Baptist, this is the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Not sins, sin. And so what he does here that makes this so powerful and so important is this. Since God has done everything to bring you to him and remove every barrier, what is your excuse for not reconciling yourself to God? Be ye reconciled to God. You see, it's an attitude problem. It comes down to your attitude toward God. Now, some folks are mad at God. They're mad at him. I understand. It happens. They get mad at God. I mean, I've pastored a long time. I've seen people lose a loved one, and they turn on God, and they get mad. And, 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 for, and it may take them years to get over it. Some folks blame God for the death of a loved one. Uh, that died, and they're, they're not sure where they went. They blame God. They come against the Lord. Some folks blame God when a loved one gets sick. Something happens in their family and they watch them suffer and they watch them die. And folks, it's no, it's, <laughs> there's no fun to watch somebody you love so, dwindle away and watch their health as it departs from them. That's hard. And I'm sure there are times come, many times, where you say, God, where are you? What happened to you? You said you'd never leave us nor forsake us. And they can, my friend, get mad at God or... They can, they can come to the point where in their life that they have, they have tried and they have tried and they have tried and they have tried and they have tried. They have tried, they've tried. They've said the sinner's prayer. They've read the scripture. They've been led to the Lord so-called time and time again, but it didn't take. It didn't take. It didn't take. And so they look at God and they say, well, I did my part. Where's your part? And they turn it on God. Instead of allowing God to speak into their heart and show them what the issue is. Let me tell you something tonight. If you have an issue with God, because that's the problem, folks. That's what the scripture is talking about. It's talking about your attitude toward God. If you have an issue with him tonight, do you? And that's very personal between you and the Lord. But do you have an issue with him? Well, then bring it to him. Do you believe that he'll answer? Do you believe in the character of God? I sat on the back porch the other day and looked off into the heavens. And I said, Lord, I cannot see myself out here somewhere wandering around. I'm on this earth to preach your word. I'm here to minister God's word. This is what I live for day in and day out. This is why I'm alive tonight. This is why I'm in this, in this pulpit. This is no burden. This is a joy. <laughs> this, this satisfies my soul. I mean, it's in my blood. <laughs> it's in me. It's what I am. And I can't imagine myself doing anything else. But I said to him, Lord, I cannot go on. Now listen carefully. I said, I cannot go on to try to reconcile, understand, make right all the stuff that's happened. But there's one thing for certain that I will do. 
I will say to you as I said to Peter, as Peter said to you, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. In other words, I said, Lord God, I ain't going nowhere. I'm going to stick with you. It makes any difference whether what this happens or that happens. I'm going to stick with you. I'm going to stick with you. Because you are the ultimate prize. You are the ultimate reason. You are the ultimate one. You're what it's all about. And I want you to do something like that with the Lord. I don't know if you've ever, you know, I don't want to put words in your mouth. But when you do something like that with God, he has a way of coming back. He does. He has a way of coming back and saying, I, good to hear from you, son. That's what I wanted to hear. It's just you and me. I said, it is, Lord. Whatever the other things happen to be, they happen. They're the peripherals. It's, I'm here pastoring, that's a peripheral. But the issue is between you and me. So in other words, am I reconciling myself to God? Am I allowing something to come between me and the Lord? Are you listening? Is, is there something that I'm afraid to bring before him? What, what world do you live in? What kind of a, what, what, do you, what do you think you're doing? You think, you think because you don't say it, God doesn't know what's in your heart? Listen, you don't know what's in your heart. God does. Let me say it again. You may think you know what's in your heart, but you really don't. God does. So what does he really want from us? What is the greatest thing you can do between you and God? This is one of the most important things I'll ever say in my life. What is it? Total transparency. Open up. Open up. Open up. Open up. If there's something eating at you that happened 20 or 30 years ago and you, know you're, and you feel ashamed to say anything to God about it and you try to cover it up, you try to forget it and it won't leave you, why don't you just bring it to him? Well, I'll hurt his feelings. You think you're talking to a man. Well, he won't understand. Oh, you kidding. Listen, the reason some of you don't have a prayer life is because you're harboring things inside your soul and you are unable to, for whatever reason, I'm, you know, I can't, I'm, I'm not going to micromanage your life, but for whatever reason, you just can't seem to be able to lay it out before God. And until you get to the point where you can lay it out before God, you're never going to have that fellowship and communion and walk with the Lord that we absolutely so desperately need. We've got to have fellowship or we're going to shrink up and die. If you're not walking in fellowship, dear friend, I don't care, what, I don't care anything about your standards and your laws and your commandments. That's nothing. That's man-made junk. If you're not walking in fellowship with God, you're not walking in the light. And if you're not walking in the light, you're walking in darkness and you're stumbling in your way. And the only way to walk in the light is he is in the light. You have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, cleanses from all sin. You need that blood constantly cleansing you day in and day out and you need to be communicating with the Father and the Son. Amen. 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 I get on my knees tonight. I get down here in the front. I don't care anything about making a spectacle. I crawl off the hole somewhere, get in the room alone, whatever it takes. Get on my face and say, Lord God, is there something harboring in my heart that I don't know about? Is there something in here that I need to know? Show me. And then when you show me, give me the grace of God to deal with it and empty it from my heart and confess it and bring it before you and lay it bare before you and then from there trust you trust your character amen trust you who you are if i bring that to god you think god's gonna beat me over the head with it no he'll forgive it and cleanse it and restore the fellowship satan's the one who told you god's ready to kick you god's after you god listen folks if god's after you how long do you think it'd take him to catch you really you know what you've done? Here's what most people do. They drag God down to their level. And you drag him down to a level that you can understand. And how do you relate that? Well, you relate it to the way you, you deal with people. The way people treat you, you talk to people, the way you understand people, then you bring God down to that level. And I'm going to talk to God the way I talk to people, and I'll, I'll relate to him the way I relate to people. And you're never going to get anywhere. He's above us. Let him talk to you. And be you reconciled to God. What's wrong with Christ? What's wrong with the Savior? You got a problem with him? What's wrong with him? Find fault with him? Is there any fault in Christ? No. You remember all I read to you this morning? They found no fault in him. Pilate's wife, Pilate, the demoniac, all of them, none of them. They found no fault in him. 
Herod, no fault in him. No fault in him. The thief on the cross, no fault. The centurion, no fault. There's nothing wrong with this man. So have you found fault in him? Well, you say, preacher, I just don't like life. I don't, I don't think it's fair. I think, oh, it's not. Who told you it was? Who told you it would be? Who told you that, the, that life is based upon fairness? Life is not based upon fairness. What's it based on, preacher? It's based on your knowledge of God. That's what it's based upon. And the only way you'll ever get a knowledge of God is to come clean with him. I mean clean with him. And be ye reconciled to God. And the first step in that is to say, Lord Jesus, there is no other Savior. There's none beside you. They're, they're dead. They're, they're dead. It's just a bunch of dead religion. But you are the one who went to the cross and died for me. And I'm going to take you as my Savior. And when you take him as your Savior, you are accepting God's reconciliation. That's right. God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. Once you accept Christ as your Savior, you have accepted reconciliation. And you're brought to the Father through the Son. Hallelujah to God. Amen, amen, amen. Reconciliation is a wonderful thing. To see two people at odds with each other. Two people have fallen out over things. It's easy to fall out over things. It's easy to get in a dog fight. It's easy to argue. All these things happen. They happen to all of us. We all have tempers. We all have sort of limited views, limited understanding of things that happen to us. We all know that. We all do that. Amen. All of us, folks. All of us do. But you see, there's something far greater than that. Far, far greater than that. And what is that? That's when two brothers embrace that we're at odds. And two sisters embrace that we're at odds. In plain words, reconcile to God. Reconcile to each other. You want to see a revival? You want to see a revival? You want to see a real revival? Let me tell you where a real revival comes from. It comes by allowing the sweet Holy Spirit of God. Freedom in a church. That freedom means that people confess, people reconcile, people get a hold of God, people open their heart and open their soul. It means that they come before the Lord. They don't come before him in, in, you know, lying and cheating and deceiving. You can do that to each other, but you can't do that to God. And then watch them reconcile. Oh, what a wonderful thing. You see, this is why I say this scripture is so important. Because that is the absolute basis and foundation of our relationship with the Lord. Reconciled together. Reconciled. During World War I, I'm sure many of you know this, you had the Germans in the, in the, in the trenches on one side and you had the British in the trenches on the other. Hundreds of thousands of men died. Some of the worst generaling was ever done on the face of this earth by the generals on both sides. One British general was called a butcher because he'd call his men up and they would charge into those machine guns and they'd mow them down. There'd be dead bodies all over the place, young 17, 18. You ought to get on the website and read some of the songs they wrote about those young men dying. It, it'd move you hard. If nothing will move you, that'll move you. The young men that died during World War I. But Christmas time came around and guess what they did? They laid their arms down. They went out into the battlefield they went out into the battlefield and they shared Christmas with each other, sang the Christmas songs. I'm telling you the truth now. I mean, some of you look at me like I'm nutty. You just check it out. They had a time of Christmas. To, now, officers hate that. The officers despise that because they, that affects the, uh, you know, the gung-ho morality of their troops. But they came together for a while and instead of killing each other, they, 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 they celebrated Christmas. What was that? That was a short window of reconciliation, a time together when they were no longer killing each other. I think of wars, I think the best wars that ever be fought is to take all the politicians and put them in one big room and the warmongers and all the rest of them have a big table out there and it's begin to debate. Now, what do you want to kill these 17 year olds for on the other side? What do you want to ruin? What do you want to destroy their lives for? What's, it, what's this? Are you going to be making money on it? Is Wall Street going to make money off of this war? Well, yeah, buddy. War is a very profitable thing, believe me. Smedley Butler, who was a major general in the Marine Corps back in the 30s or the 40s, as high as you get, he said, and he said he'd been in South America and Panama and somewhere down in there fighting the wars for Wall Street so that they, they he protect their investments and so forth. He said this, he said, war is a racket. 
Now, I haven't looked, but a lot of the coats that I wear up here, I look at the label on them, and guess where they're made? Guess. Vietnam. I was in during Vietnam. 50,000 young men went over there and died in Vietnam. If it was so horrible for them to go over there and die in Vietnam in the 60s, what's changed? Could it be that the investors in Wall Street would have made more of a profit had they won that war in Vietnam? Because believe me, they're making a profit tonight. Yeah, they are. Yeah, they are. Wars and rumors of wars. Amen. <laughs> How'd I get on that? I don't like wars. I don't like warmongers. I don't like what's going on in Israel right now. I don't like the fact that I saw the other day, I saw a, a video where they pulled a little, looks like she was 10 or 12 year old, little Arab girl, uh, they call her Palestinian. They pulled her out of this rubble, little old, poor little old thing, blood all over her face. She just as innocent as they come. They're, they don't come any more innocent than that little child. And little children are dying over there. But little children died in Israel too. They took little children, they took little babies and cut their heads off. They took little babies and threw them into a fire and burned them alive. They, came, they, they became monsters when they came into that country. So what's happening? Well, Israel is doing what any nation would do. They're defending their, their borders. They're trying to defend their people. So why does all this happen? A fallen man. That's why. There will be no peace on this earth until the Prince of Peace comes to bring peace with him. Amen. Until then, it's one dog fight right after another. I don't like wars, and I don't like collateral damage. I don't like any of it. I don't like to see little children on either side butchered and dying because of some war. But what can I do about it? I can't stop it. I can't do a thing about it. But I can do this. I can pray, even so come, Lord Jesus, come. Is that your attitude toward war? Do you get excited about war? They say that when the Civil War started, that some of those men marched off into war singing songs. And it was such a, such a, it was such a wondrous time for them, they couldn't wait to get onto the battlefield. And they carried 500, 600,000 of them back. They didn't make it. 600,000 men died in the Civil War. Think about that number. That's a huge number died in the civil war there's a war for your soul tonight we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities power spiritual wickedness in high places how do you arm yourself against it you arm yourself against your enemy by your knowledge of god do you have a knowledge do you know what i'm talking about how many of you how many of you will, sp will, will stake your eternity on what you know about god that's important that's very important can you see yourself in any of these people mephibosheth in Lodibar, he couldn't walk. Mephibosheth. Who was it that said, let me show mercy, grace to the house of Saul because of Jonathan, right? There he had, David had a love for Jonathan. And so therefore, he showed mercy to Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth said, who am I, a dead dog, that you bring me to the house of the king and set me down at the table? Well, that's exactly what he did. And what did that? Grace. What about that newborn lying in the field? Newborn babe out there. And here, still in its, in, in its, in its birth. Uh, it's, uh, you know, <laughs> dying in the field. Nobody showed mercy to it. But the Lord said, when I passed by thee and saw thee, I said unto thee, live. That's a picture of the unsaved man. Totally incapable, totally vulnerable to his sins. He can't save himself. Then there's Gomer standing on the, on the stage to be sold as a slave. She'd been used up and abused, used and abused. That's what the world does till it gets everything it wants out of you. Once it does, it's ready to sell you. But what happened? God said, Hosea, I want you to buy a woman of whoredoms. You buy her, you buy her, because this is the love. He, she became a type of Israel. This is the love I have for my people. What about Adam and Eve? They didn't ask for it, but they were naked and tried to cover themselves with fig leaves. Didn't do the job, did it? That's like trying to cover yourself with religion. Fundamental Baptist. I'm a fundamental Baptist. Oh, are you? I'm glad to hear that. Are you a Bible believer? That means far more in the sight of God. Far more. Do you believe the Bible? 
Because there are fundamental Baptists out there now, I've been told, that, have, that deny the deity of Christ. They say that he's, he's not the God-man, he's just a man. Oh, yeah? Well, you don't belong to me, and I don't belong to your crowd. The Lord Jesus Christ is God Almighty manifest in the flesh. You better believe it. How about the Syrophoenician woman? Lord, Lord, Lord. Lord, he said, I, have no, I can't take what's for the kid, the children and give it to a dog. Yea, Lord, I'm a dog. I know I'm a dog. But there's just something about your nature. There's just something in my soul that tells me that you can't turn me away if I come to you crying out in mercy and asking and begging for you to do something for me and my family. I just know it. I know it, Lord. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not a daughter of David, a, a, a child of, of, of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. No, I'm not. I have no rightful claim. But I claim your nature. That's what she appealed to. The nature of the Lord. Why don't you try that tonight? Try it tonight. Try it. Why don't you come to God and say, Lord, I'm going to try to forget everything I've ever been taught about you. I'm just going to come to you as you, as you, who you are. I am who I am. Let's talk on that level. Oh, preacher, you'll defend God. You kidding? You kidding? You're not going to offend him. What you're going to do is open up a way of communication with him. And you're going to push aside. Because you see, friend, churches have become so perverted so full of, of apostasy today that you can't trust the church you're going to. The people come in here all the time and they say, preacher, there is no church where I live. There's nowhere. So Temple Baptist Church is our church. What a burden and what a blessing to be able to do that. Then the leper, what did he do with the leper? Drive him on out into the wilderness, into the darkness? No, 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 no. He healed him. He healed him. What I preach to you tonight is not kosher in some areas. We got a young man sitting in this church tonight, the uh, local Sanhedrin and hierarchy, religious hierarchy said, you're not qualified to preach. You can't preach. You're not going to be able to preach until you go to our schools and you're indoctrinated with our catechisms and we put our hands on you and approve you to be able to go into the ministry and preach. And yet this morning I had a man walk out of here that came from another state and he said to me, you know something preacher, that young man that was up there preaching the other night, he said, boy, he's changed, hadn't he? I said, yeah, he has, he's growing. God's filling him, he's maturing. God's using him and God's gonna use him. You know why? Because the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. He's going to use him. He has used him. He's going to use him more. And I like to say, this bunch over here that tells him he's not qualified to preach. And that's been my attitude for 47 years. They all know me. I couldn't care less what your crowd says. You don't feed me. You don't, you've got nothing to do with this church. Let God call them and let God bless them and let God use them. And he is doing it. And you're watching it. Amen. They told Whitfield. You remember George Whitfield? They said, Mr. Whitfield... You know, you're a fine man, you mean well. But until you've been through our system, gone to our schools and ordained by our crowd and this and that and so forth and so on, you're not gonna be qualified and God will never use you. You're just, you're, just not to, you're, you're just not gonna be able to go out and do it. Whitfield said, that's all right, boys. Don't worry about it. He went out there and he started preaching. And they said in history that when George Whitfield got up and started preaching, that you could see the horses and the buggies as they were flying to where he was and the, and the smoke was boiling out like this. And tens of thousands of people would gather together to hear George Whitfield before they had PA systems. This was in the 1700s. And God used that man to lay the foundation for the great awakening in this country, George Whitfield. One of the most wonderful ministers, preachers of the word of God that ever lived. So they came to him one day and they said, Mr. Whitfield, it's obvious that God's got his hand on you now. And we want you to become part of our group because we need you. We want your picture hanging on the wall with the rest of our great reverends. And Brother Whitfield said, I'm sorry, boys. You didn't want me then. You don't need me now. God took me. He ordained me and he's used me. Go back your way. Go, do you, go back to your religious hierarchy. Uh, go back to your dead catacombs, wherever you came from, and I'll go on doing what God's called me to do. That's what I believe in in here. Well, let me break it down simply. If God's put his hand on you to preach, God's going to give you something 
that the man next door doesn't have. Now, well, a preacher, I know a church where they say everybody's a preacher. No, they're not. Now, preaching in, the, in a generic sense where you're giving the word out, fine, but that's not preaching. There needs to be a call from God. There comes an anointing from God. There comes a message from God. There comes something inside your soul, and the people know it. When you get up and you open up the Bible, they know that you're getting something from above. The message comes across. It gets a hold of you, and it begins to stir you. That's what preaching is about. Now, teaching is different, and teaching is wonderful. We need teaching. All commit thou to faithful men is able to teach others also. All for teaching. God bless you, I am. But that's not preaching. Preaching is on a different level entirely. And it takes a call from God to do that. And no man calls himself into it. God called you into it. I got saved. My wife says, okay. I married a drunk, but if that's what you're going to be, all right. Got saved. Then I come back to her and I said, God's called me to preach. She said, no, he hadn't. I didn't, I didn't bargain for this. I didn't marry into a preacher. Uh, what do you mean he's called you to preach? I said, he's called me to preach. Well, she, uh, it, it upset her. I understand because she saw the future and she knew that, that, uh, that being a preacher, everything had changed. Then I come in one day and I said, well, there's a church over there on Woodrow Drive. They want me to be their pastor. Nope. <laughs> what do you mean, Pastor. They want me to be their pastor. Are you kidding? No, I'm not kidding. They called me up and I answered the phone and he said, would you come over here and would you talk to us about taking Temple Baptist Church and becoming its pastor? Now I could have said, well, now look folks, I've only been married, uh, saved three years. Saved in 73, started in 76. Only, only been saved three. I'm green as the grass. Yeah, but we need a pastor. We need him now because they'd already been through about five or six in a period of about five or six years. And so I took the church. Why did I take the church? Because I didn't know any better. Didn't have any sense. I thought it was like taking another job. I rolled my toolbox for more, for more than one place, believe me. I said, all right. And I got up in the pulpit and I looked around at those people and I thought to myself, what have I done? I really did. I thought, what have I done? Has my big mouth got me into something this time? What am I going to do? And that's when I had to get it settled. Not to preach. I knew he'd call me to preach, but to pastor. Is this what God wants me to do? And I got it settled. I know what he, taught me to, I know what he called me to do. I got it settled. No problem. And stuck with it up until this point. Can I help you with that tonight? Is there anybody in here who needs help with that? Take it step at a time. Take it step at a time. One step at a time. We need teachers. We need people that will study the Bible. We need men full of the Holy Ghost who want to be a deacon. Let them first be proved. We need men who will study and set themselves apart and dedicate their life and consecrate themselves to God as elders in the church of the living God. We need men where God can lay his hand upon their soul and move in their heart and raise them up to a bishop to accept the responsibility of leadership. Leadership is something that you learn in your soul. You learn the elements of leadership. It's not an easy thing. And it challenges you. It, 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 it drives you against the wall to lead people. Leadership. But it's so necessary. So here I am, a bishop in the church of God. 77 years old, 47 years in this church. And I couldn't be more satisfied with my life. I say that to you tonight with my heart, my soul. I'm satisfied. I'm satisfied. Are you? How many of you God's laid his hand on? He wants you to start teaching, study, get in here and help. Get, put your feelings aside and do something in this church to help this church. Temple Baptist Church is going to go on. Now, this brother over here. Here he is over here playing this piano. and he does, <laughs> All by ear. I look over at him and I think, we're in this world. Did that kind of a gift come from? But it's his gift. And that's what he's doing. What about you? Can you sing? Can you sing? Can you play an instrument? Why don't you do it for God? Because as long as you sit there and hold back and don't do it, you're not going to get anywhere. And it's going to be, an, it's going to be a thorn in your flesh that's going to come between you and God for the rest of your life. Amen. 
And some of you can. And you can be a great help and a blessing to the church. If you do that, would you do that? Some of you men in here, young men, God may be speaking to you about preaching his word. Now, I'm not calling you to preach. It's not my place to do it. But I'm going to tell you something. If he's really called you to preach, you can run until you drop. And you're never going to get away from it. You might as well begin to face up to the fact that you're going to have to give an account to God to preach his word. I won't be around forever. If the Lord doesn't come back, I'll be gone. I'll be gone. You need young men to step up that are able to preach. And then they are elders and then they become bishops. That's going to happen if the Lord doesn't come back. I want Temple Baptist Church to go on with all of my soul and everything that's in me. I want this church to go on and carry the message it's carrying tonight. Amen. I don't want this church to become apostatized. I don't want it to happen here. I don't want this church to ever consider it's about numbers or it's about how many people are here and we need to do what we do, need to do to hold a crowd. No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. We need to do what we need to do tonight to please our Lord Jesus Christ and lift up his high and holy name in this place and let it go on. If I'm gone, I'm gone, but the church will go on with somebody in the pulpit that believes that Bible that's called of God with the unction and anointing on them. And then God will bless it. I would hate to think after 47 years of my life poured into this church that something happens to me and the church just folds. There are churches around that were huge during the lifetime of the pastor. But I've watched some of those churches, the pastor dies, and it wasn't but a few years before it went apostate and busted up entirely. And some of you probably know who I'm talking about. They had a Bible college, and it just busted up. Somebody failed somewhere, somewhere, and I don't want the failure to be here. Let's lay the foundation for what we believe for the truth. Let this church continue on, Temple Baptist Church, as a church that is a Bible-believing church that stands, my dear friend, with everything that's in you for the deity of Christ, for the fact that Christ is God manifest in the flesh. That's first. None of the rest of it matters. If you don't get that part right, forget the rest of it. He's God manifest in the flesh. And the Holy Ghost will take that knowledge and he'll build everything that needs to be built from and around it. Amen. Amen. Father, bless your word tonight. I pray for these dear folk who've come into the house, those that are watching. Lord, I don't know how long it'll be before you come back. I pray you come back before the sun comes up. I pray you come and get us at any moment. And the rapture takes place in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. That's my prayer, Lord. But I'm also a pragmatist. I also know that I won't be here forever. But Lord, lay your hand upon Temple Baptist Church and bless this church. And give it the foundation that it's unshakable. And that if I'm not here, that they'll pick a man. They'll have someone in this house that can preach your word, that loves temple. And that'll carry on with the truth. And it'll abide. It'll abide until you come. I pray for that tonight. I pray for it in Jesus' name. For his sake I ask it. Amen. Well, stand up tonight. What have we got, brother? Well, she's going